don't freak out about Trump's classified documents because when the president does it, it's not a crime. If the president does it, then it is not illegal. Where have I heard that before? Well, when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. Or the FBI planted the documents. Or Trump declassified all of the documents, he just didn't tell anyone. Like so much spaghetti, the Trump world is throwing all kinds of defenses against the wall. But do any of them stick? So today we're gonna to talk about the various completely coherent and not at all mutually exclusive defenses that former President Trump is asserting. And we're also gonna talk about three big recent developments, namely that Trump's legal team, after two weeks of doing nothing, has now done something in the form of a horribly written motion for a special master. Additionally, one of Trump's friends released a letter from NARA. Uh, why he thought this was a good idea for the former president is beyond me. And finally, the magistrate judge has agreed to unseal part of the probable cause affidavit that gave rise to the search warrant. Now, one of Trump's defenses for having government records and documents containing alleged national secrets and nuclear weapons related information at Mar-a-Lago is that he had a standing order to immediately declassify any material brought into the White House residence and then later removed to Mar-a-Lago. Now, this is not a particularly good defense to prosecution under the three laws cited in the search warrant that we know of because none of those offenses depend on the material being classified itself. For example, 18 USC 1519 outlines the federal crime of obstruction of justice for destroying, altering, or falsifying government records. It's illegal to mutilate, conceal, or alter, quote, any record, document, or tangible object if the act is done with the intent to impede, obstruct, or influence an investigation. It doesn't matter if the material itself was classified or not. The only thing that the government has to show is that someone was destroying or altering any tangible object for the purpose of obstructing an investigation. But nonetheless, let's look into the claim that Trump had a secret standing order to declassify records. Rick Reynolds, uh, Trump's national security director said that, quote, there is a phony idea that he must provide notification for classification, but that's just silly. Who is he supposed to notify? Well, the answer is he's supposed to notify the American people and uh, members of the administration. When something is declassified, that means the public is allowed to see the information. The declassification system isn't about the president's convenience. Uh, Glenn Gerstel, the, the top lawyer for the National Security Agency from 2015 to 2020, called Trump's claim preposterous. He said that the information should be logged so it could be identified. He also said that Trump should notify the federal agencies uh, that use those documents. But Trump's power as commander in chief gave him broad authority to declassify records. But Trump didn't wield his power to declassify records in the way that past presidents did, which is probably why we keep hearing new theories about how he might have declassified information. We can learn a lot by looking at what his predecessor did with classified information. President Obama issued Executive Order 13526 on December 29th, 2009. Obama's order created a national declassification center with a mission to declassify government materials and make them available to the public. To that end, the Obama order established that no records may remain classified indefinitely in an attempt to increase government transparency. The order also provides deadlines for declassifying information exempted from automatic declassification at 25 years. The National Declassification Center is part of the National Archives. Now, Trump did not rescind Obama's executive order, and that means that government departments are still following its procedures. Trump himself was probably not obligated to follow this order when declassifying records, uh, although some lawyers have argued that Trump was legally required to follow the order or rescind it. Now, courts have never had to decide this issue because presidents who don't agree with their predecessor's orders simply rescind them and issue new ones. But the argument goes, because Trump was president and had plenary powers to declassify things, he could just declassify documents without telling anyone. Ah oh yes, the Vulcan mind declassification. I know what you know. Now, during his administration, Trump asserted that he could declassify records by word, tweet, or thought. For example, on October 6, 2020, Trump tweeted, quote, I have fully authorized the total declassification of any and all documents pertaining to the single greatest political crime in American history, the Russia hoax. Likewise, the Hillary Clinton email scandal, no redactions, exclamation point. Now, news organizations rushed to obtain the apparently declassified documents, but the Trump White House denied that the president had the authority to declassify records by tweet without following protocol. White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows said that Trump's tweets about declassifying documents related to the Russia investigation were not in order to declassify or release further documents. He filed a sworn declaration stating, quote, the president indicated to me that his statements on Twitter were not self-executing declassification orders and do not require the declassification or release of any particular documents. Trump's defenders claim that he declassified material simply by speaking the words aloud, and that the real problem is that other people didn't follow the appropriate processes 
was after Trump spoke. Former Pentagon employee Cash Patel said that he was in the room when Trump said that they were declassifying information. Patel then threw White House lawyers under the bus, quote, White House counsel failed to generate the paperwork to change the classification markings, but that doesn't mean the information wasn't declassified. Now, when a document is declassified, it's stamped with the word declassified and the date that the records were declassified. If that didn't happen, the records haven't been declassified, or at least they must be treated as still classified. Now, none of that has stopped Trump's defenders from claiming that Trump's declassification powers were so broad that he could actually declassify stuff with his mind. Uh, a spokesperson for the Heritage Foundation said, quote, there's a rich debate about whether or not a document is declassified if the president has decided, but not communicated it outside of his own head. Now, maybe there is a debate uh, at the Heritage Foundation, but uh, that defense would probably not work in a court of law to suggest that the president's thoughts have the power of law. Now, bottom line, if the allegedly declassified documents weren't modified to state that they had been declassified, then they hadn't been declassified. Now, Trump's defenders have also claimed that the president can't break uh, any laws because the president is literally above the law when it comes to this situation. Fox News laid out this theory succinctly. Famously, President Nixon said, if the president does it, then it is not illegal. Ah yes, Richard Nixon, famously accurate arbiter of legality. Uh, now here's the backstory to this particular claim. Uh, in a series of interviews with the BBC's uh, David Frost, former president Richard Nixon argued that the constitution allows the president to break the law. When Frost uh, pressed Nixon on authorizing the burglary at the Watergate Hotel, which he knew was illegal, Nixon said, Well, when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. By definition. Exactly. Uh, the president's decision in that instance uh, is one uh, that enables those who carry it out to carry it out without violating a law. Nixon and Trump shared a theory of the unitary executive that placed no limits on the president's power. Trump claimed that as president, the constitution vested him with total authority. Then I have an article two where I have the right to do whatever I want as president, but I don't even talk about that. The unitary executive was originally a limited thesis about the president's power to remove upper level executive branch officials. But over many years, the theory has expanded in scope. Presidents invoke the unitary executive theory whenever they want more expansive power. Uh, but in 2020, the Supreme Court ruled against Trump's version of the unitary executive theory in a case where he challenged New York's right to subpoena Trump and the Trump organization for alleged financial crimes. In Trump versus Vance, the court rejected the proposition that uh, a sitting president can use uh, their powers under Article II of the Constitution to assert immunity from criminal uh, investigation. The majority opinion also rejected Trump's alternate theory that prosecutors should make a heightened showing of need before issuing a subpoena to the president. Uh, then in Trump versus Mazars, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that the president wasn't immune from congressional subpoenas. Now in Mazars, the court ruled that Congress had not established a purpose for demanding the Trump records, while in Vance, the court ordered Trump to respond to the subpoena for the same financial records. However, both of these cases rejected the special needs standard for issuing a criminal or congressional subpoena to a president. And the Vance and Mazars cases are in line with the Supreme Court's other decisions on the limits of presidential power. In US versus Nixon, the court ruled that uh, Richard Nixon had to turn over White House records to a special prosecutor. And in Clinton versus Jones, the court also held that the president can be sued civilly for private conduct before he took office. Still, the counter argument is that the president has plenary authority over classification and declassification of documents. If a sitting president were to decide to uh, declassify every single record in the United States government, the president has that power. It's just a matter of uh, telling people and, and making sure that they follow the process to do so. Though such arguments are probably not gonna help a former president who is no longer the president. But what about the claims of attorney-client privilege and executive privilege? Well, Trump also claims that the gathered documents are protected by various kinds of privilege. He wrote in some sort of tweet-like thing, uh, oh great, it has just been learned that the FBI and its now famous raid of Mar-a-Lago took boxes of privileged attorney-client material and also executive privilege material, which they knowingly should not have taken. By copy of this truth, I respectfully request that these documents be immediately returned to the location from which they were taken. Thank you, exclamation point. So let's say you have a friend sitting in on a meeting with your lawyer or you CC your dad on an email uh, to your lawyer, well, you have then waived the attorney-client privilege. And when can that privilege be raised? Well, when someone makes a legal demand for things that involve communications between a lawyer and a client. This could be made through a discovery request during litigation, uh, or through a subpoena for documents served on a lawyer, or it could be made by someone requesting that a lawyer testify under oath. The client is the person who uh, is said to hold the privilege. That means that the client can waive the attorney-client privilege as a defense, uh, but a lawyer cannot waive the 
the privilege without the client's consent. And the person claiming privilege has the burden of proving that they are entitled to that privilege. Now here, Trump has been making a privilege argument to assert that the FBI took material that was covered by the attorney-client privilege. And it's possible that the investigators removed documents that are covered by the privilege. For example, we know that the FBI collected and took some of Trump's passports, uh, though they did uh, return that shortly thereafter. And that's because when officers execute a search warrant, they don't read every page of every document that they find. That could take days or even months or years. Instead, they quickly identify material that fits within the warrant specifics and then remove it. Uh, then a, a team of lawyers and investigators go through the material in detail. Um, the Wall Street Journal reported that the DOJ has already set up a filter team, also known as a taint team, to review the seized materials before they are viewed by investigators to determine whether any of those documents are indeed uh, protected by attorney-client privilege. Now, attorney-client privilege is tricky when you're talking about advice that the president received as president. Discussions between, say, the president and the attorney general are not shielded by the attorney-client privilege. The attorney general is not the president's lawyer. Uh, many of these relationships in the executive branch are effectively between the the office of the president and the attorneys, not specifically the president as a person individually, which is why things like executive privilege exist, which we'll talk about in just a second. But by the same token, presidents do hire lawyers in their individual capacity, and that's when attorney-client privilege would attach. Think Clinton during the Lewinsky scandal or Trump and Giuliani. I mean, I guess. Uh, did we ever figure out if he was actually Trump's individual attorney? Um, We'll have to get back to that. But anyway, attorney-client privilege would attach to those communications between the individual who is the president and their individual lawyer. Uh, and also the work product doctrine would protect documents created in those relationships. But if some of the documents uh, are covered by the attorney-client privilege, one would assume that that is mutually exclusive to those documents belonging to the government and needing to return to uh, the government as well. But in a weird twist, it's the exact opposite for the other privilege that uh, Trump asserts. Trump also asserts executive privilege over the taken documents. He seems to believe that all of the records taken during the search were inappropriately removed on the basis of executive privilege. Apparently Trump's theory of executive privilege is everything I want to keep secret is therefore secret in perpetuity forever, but that has never matched uh, what the law says. Most legal scholars conclude that since the privilege of executive privilege attaches to the office of the presidency rather than the person who is occupying that office, a current president can decide whether his predecessors can invoke executive privilege or not. A former president might be able to assert executive privilege, but it would be up to the current president to uphold that assertion or not. The DOJ would probably argue that even if some of the documents seized because of the warrant are covered by executive privilege, all the documents documents are legally property of the government. Uh, but since executive privilege attaches to the executive branch documents and specifically the current office holder of the president of the United States, it seems like if Trump possesses any executive privilege documents, then Trump necessarily is in violation of the statutes that we've talked about. In other words, if executive privilege is in play, which it doesn't seem like it should be because Trump isn't in office anymore, it seems like Trump shouldn't have any of those documents. So claims of executive privilege might actually be a confession. We did what we came here to do. Generally, former presidents do not have a right to keep documents secret or take them home from the White House because of executive privilege. Executive privilege accrues to the benefit of the office of the president. Some of the issues surrounding executive privilege were litigated in a case called Nixon versus the Administrator of General Services. When Richard Nixon resigned, he left behind millions of pages of documents and many audio recordings of his time in office. Uh, he had an agreement with the Administrator of the Office of General Services to store these materials near his California home. This agreement also specified that Nixon could destroy some of the materials at his discretion. But Congress passed the Presidential Records Act in part to stop Nixon from destroying these important records. And Nixon challenged the constitutionality of the PRA. The Supreme Court, however, upheld the act. The court held that it was constitutional to give custody of the materials to officials who worked in the executive branch, and that these materials could only be released if that action was not barred by some applicable executive privilege. Now, with respect to executive privilege, the Supreme Court rejected Nixon's claim that presidential privilege barred 
archivists from scrutinizing the materials. Nixon raised First Amendment and privacy concerns about what was in the materials from his presidency, but the court held that the intrusions into Nixon's private life were minimal, and any intrusion was outweighed by a clear public interest in preserving materials for legitimate historical and governmental purposes. Now here, Trump seems to be asserting executive privilege over the materials that were stored in Mar-a-Lago, but Trump probably doesn't have a right to claim executive privilege as an ex-president. That privilege is held by the current president per Nixon versus GSA. Uh, in that Nixon case, the Supreme Court held that, quote, executive privilege is not for the benefit of the president as an individual, but for the benefit of the Republic. The Supreme Court recognized, quote, the presumptive confidentiality of presidential communications as a qualified privilege. That privilege is necessary because a president, quote, and those who assist him must be free to explore alternatives in the process of shaping policies and making decisions uh, and to do so in a way many would be unwilling to express except privately. The court concluded that executive privilege could hypothetically be asserted by a former president, but only as to materials whose content falls within the scope of, quote, communications in performance of a president's responsibilities of his office and made in the process of shaping policies and making decisions. So far, no former president has been able to meet this standard since it emphasizes the materials had to have been made while the person was president in the process of making presidential decisions. And the same principle applies to materials created before the president is sworn in as president. Trump's allies tried to enlarge the scope of executive privilege so that it applied to the president-elect, but at least a district court ruling said that executive privilege may not be asserted by a president-elect over communications made before he takes office. So with a background on Trump's defenses out of the way, let's look at the new developments. The first big development is that Trump finally filed something in court. Trump's legal team did not file anything challenging the search warrant for two weeks after the search. And this is really inexcusable. If law enforcement takes materials that are protected by attorney-client privilege or are a lawyer's work product, that's an urgent matter that should be challenged within days or even hours of the search. When Trump's legal team got around to filing something, however, they chose to file a motion to appoint a special master. Now that's not a crazy request. It's governed by federal rule of civil procedure 53, which provides the court in which any action is pending may appoint a special master therein and that a reference to a special master shall be the exception, not the rule. Now the traditional rule of a special master is to hold evidentiary hearings and make rulings that will facilitate a trial in the court where the matter is pending. They're used to assist the judge in making discovery rulings, facilitating settlements, supervising electronic discovery, reviewing documents and data that might be privileged. Now, a special master in the Trump case could be appointed to review all the material that was removed from Mar-a-Lago to determine if any of it is indeed privileged. That's not unusual for a special master to be appointed to assist with that litigation, but it's not clear what value that would have for Trump. He's not really challenging the warrant itself. Now, before we get to the substance of this motion, I should point out that it's just terribly, terribly written. Uh, in the very basics of the motion. Uh, Trump's lawyers filed it as a separate case, which appears to be wrong, which is why the clerks docketed it as a complaint, but it's not a complaint in the traditional sense. Uh, the motion doesn't include a statement of facts or any evidence, uh, and they should have attached a declaration or a sworn statement from Trump or Trump's lawyers attesting to the facts that they uh, attest to. They could have provided plenty of evidence to support their case if it exists, like for example, the videotapes of the the FBI searching Mar-a-Lago, but they just didn't. It only attaches a couple of exhibits related to the warrant itself. And the motion also ignores some of DOJ's strongest facts that Trump's lawyer signed a sworn statement in June claiming that they had returned all of the documents. Trump could have filed an affidavit saying that he personally believed he had returned all the records or that Christina Bob didn't have the authority to speak for him or the, he had no idea that he had to return the documents or something to refute his own lawyer's statements. But instead the motion just quotes commentary that Trump posted on Truth Social uh, but these assertions are not the same as swearing to facts under the penalty of perjury, which is normally what you would do in a motion like this. But perhaps the most incredible thing about this motion is that it appears to admit that Trump committed the crimes at issue. After chronicling the timeline of the back and forth between Trump and the government and how uh, Trump and his team did a diligent search for classified documents and turned them over, he then admits that when the counterintelligence team at the DOJ's National Security Division came back in June, Trump gave them apparently more classified documents that they had withheld held before. Uh, it, the motion in a truly spectacular use of passive voice states, quote, responsive documents were provided to the FBI agents. And despite Trump's vague assertions that he cooperated with the government, the bottom line is that these records were sitting in boxes at the basement of a private club 
And they belong to NARA and Trump wouldn't give them back. And it looks more and more like the DOJ and NARA bent over backwards with Trump on getting the records back. And they only applied for a search warrant when he refused to return the government property. And then of course there's Trump's new lawyers. Trump seems to find himself in a familiar situation, hiring new lawyers without much vetting and then watching the lawyers make careless mistakes. For example, the motion to appoint a special master was signed by three lawyers, a Florida licensed insurance lawyer, Lindsey Halligan, plus Jim Trusty from Washington DC and Everett Corcoran from Baltimore. Now in the US, lawyers are licensed to practice in specific jurisdictions. So if a lawyer wants to represent a client in a state where he or she is not licensed, they have to file a motion with the court asking them to be admitted. This is a very straightforward process known as pro hoc vice. Now this is a very easy motion. You basically just fill out a form and say that you're in good standing in the places that you practice. But trustee and Corcoran failed to do this. The court rejected their motions and issued a paperless order on the docket stating that local counsel is instructed to refile the motions in strict accordance with local rule 4B of the rules governing the admission practice, peer review, and discipline of attorneys, a sample motion can be found on the court's website at uh, that URL. The motions were denied without prejudice, but it's really just really careless mistakes. But going back to the motion to appoint a special master, despite Trump's social media claims that his team would be filing a major fourth amendment motion, the lawyers did not file a motion to suppress the warrant and the special master doesn't have the authority to throw the warrant out. And since it looks like Trump's team filed this in the wrong court, instead of in the same case that gave rise to the search warrant, uh, the new court wasted no time in responding to the motion. Uh, the judge actually ordered Trump's team to quote, file a supplement to the motion, further elaborating on the following. One, the asserted basis for the exercise of this court's jurisdiction, whether legal, equitable, anomalous, or both. Two, the framework applicable to the court's jurisdiction. Three, the precise relief sought, including any request for injunctive relief pending resolution of the motion. Four, the effect, if any, of the proceeding before magistrate Bruce E. Reinhardt. And five, the status of the plaintiff's efforts to perfect service on defendants. Basically, that's the court's way of being extremely skeptical that they filed in the right court, that this court has any power to do anything, and basically suggesting that they should go back in front of uh, Magistrate Reinhardt to deal with this particular issue. Now, the second big development is that John Solomon, the man Trump named as his personal representative with the National Archives, released a letter from the National Archives to Trump. Now, I'm gonna assume this letter is real, but so far it hasn't been validated. But also, I have no idea why this was released because it's incredibly damaging to Trump's claims. Uh, the archivist uh, quoted the applicable parts of the Nixon case to explain why it was so important for NARA to have custody of the records. Quote, the Supreme Court specifically noted that an incumbent president should not be dependent on happenstance or the whim of a prior president when he seeks access to records of past decisions that define or channel current governmental obligations. And the letter states that Trump is blocking the National Archives from taking boxes of national security information to the DOJ and to the intelligence community so that they can assess what information might have been revealed to third parties. The letter says that these officials need to take steps to mitigate the harms from the mishandling of the material. Essentially, the archivist is saying that it's urgently important for government officials to do a damage assessment because some of its intelligence sources could have been burned by Trump. The letter tells Trump that the incumbent president, Biden, needs the records and that the DOJ had already explained all of this to him. Quote, there are important national security interests in the FBI and others in the intelligence community getting access to these materials. According to NARA, among the materials in the box are over 100 documents with classification markings comprising more than 700 pages. Some include the highest levels of classification, including special access programs, SAT materials. Access to the materials is not only necessary for purposes of our ongoing criminal investigation, but the executive branch must also conduct an assessment of the potential damage resulting from the apparent manner in which these materials were stored and transported and take any necessary remedial steps. The National Archives originally wanted them by the end of April, 2022, but Trump sent NARA a letter on April 29th informing NARA that in his opinion, they were covered by executive privilege. This delayed the process for an additional month. NARA rejected the assertion of privilege though. The archivist consulted with the assistant attorney general for the office of legal counsel, which quote, advised me that there is no precedent for an assertion of executive privilege by a former president against an incumbent president to prevent the latter from obtaining from NARA presidential records belonging to the federal government, where such records contain information that is needed for the conduct of current business of the incumbent president's office and that is not otherwise available. So assuming this letter is accurate, it's just insane that Trump did not turn over all of the documents months and months ago. And then the final
final development is that parts of the affidavit that gave rise to the search warrant are unsealed. While uh, Trump said that he wanted the affidavit unsealed, he actually didn't join or do anything with respect to the motion to unseal the, the search warrant. But despite that, several news organizations did move forward with the motion. And the magistrate judge ruled in favor of unsealing parts of the affidavit with redactions. Quote, as I ruled from the bench at the conclusion of the hearing, I find that on the present record, the government has not met its burden of showing that the entire affidavit should remain sealed. Generally, affidavits like these are not revealed until an indictment has been filed because it could impact an investigation. But generally speaking, there's a presumption of validity of these affidavits, but that doesn't mean that a defendant can't challenge the warrant if it's based on deliberate falsehoods or other wrongdoing. And if a search warrant is defective or deficient, a criminal defendant can file a motion to suppress evidence from being used at trial. Uh, but since Trump has not been charged with a crime, filing a motion to suppress is not yet an option, though it might be in the future. But if you'd like to hear a better thought out legal defense, you should listen to John Grisham's new legal thriller, The Judge's List on today's sponsor, Audible. It's all about a judge who's also a serial killer and uses the law against his investigators. His legal arguments are actually better than Trump's lawyers. Now I use Audible almost every day. It's by far the best source of audio entertainment. I listen to audiobooks when I'm running, cleaning up, or when I'm supposed to be listening to friends and family. Uh, Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment all in one place. If you tried to listen to everything that's on there, it would take you three centuries. Now, as an Audible member, you'll get one credit every month that you can use on any title in the entire premium catalog. That includes basically every bestseller, new release, and memoir. Those titles are yours to keep forever in your Audible library. And you also get full access to their popular uh, Plus catalog, which is filled with thousands and thousands of audiobooks, original entertainment, guided fitness and meditation, sleep tracks, and shows. All are included with your Audible membership, no credits needed. And right now, Audible's running a special promo. New Audible members get a free one month trial. You can try it out and see why everyone loves Audible. All you have to do is go to audible.com slash legal eagle or click on the link that's on screen right now or in the description. So right now for a limited time, get a free one month trial of Audible by clicking on the link below. And after that, click on this playlist over here for more Legal Eagle or I'll see you in court.